Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see you all here again on this, our second lecture in the current Tipperary People and Places series. Tonight we have Dr. Salvador Ryan with us, and Salvador um, is, I won't say a regular, but he has <laughs> come on a few occasions. I think this might be your third visit. Third, I think, yeah. And um, we're all agog as to what he's going to say tonight, and maybe even sing, because he normally entertains us <laughs> highly. Um, tonight he is going to speak on the memorial card and its cultural and historical significance. And as he said, we all know it for when we pick up our prayer book and they all fall around the floor, under the pew if you happen to be in the church, or uh, <coughs> some of us might use it as a bookmark, which mightn't be uh, the right thing to do. But still, it's grand and it means our loved ones are still close by. So without any further ado, I hand you over to Salvador. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, for that very warm introduction, and it's, it's lovely to be here again at the Tipperary uh, People and Places lecture series. So just maybe by way of introduction, I, I've been interested in memorial cards for many, many years, and obviously, like yourselves, grew up with them and was very familiar with them. I think that that interest was even heightened uh, uh, a couple of years ago during COVID when all sorts of projects started when we were all at home and we were thinking of things to do. And in my own native parish of Duncairn and Moneygall, um, a, a project started, a memorial card project, where the, the parish community collected uh, as many memorial cards as they could from, from parishioners and they were asked to go back as far as they could go and either scan them, send them in, and they'd be scanned, or, or, or scan them and send them in. And these were produced in a book called um, um, In Loving Memory, I think it was called. And I think they gathered something in the region of two and a half thousand memorial cards, and they were reproduced in, in the book. And I remember saying at the time when the book was, uh, was going to be published, I said, look, if you want me to do an introduction to it on the history of memorial cards, I'm very happy to do it. And I think that was the first time that I actually sat down properly to research memorial cards and their history. And they have a fascinating history. So that's by, by way of introduction. And some of the examples that I will be uh, that I'll be showing tonight are actually from my own native parish and were produced in that book. Um, so there, there are people from Duncairn and Moneygall and even people from Shinron and, and, and so on. Um, okay, without further ado, we will get started. The memorial, humble memorial card is a wonderful thing. It is also one of the most underappreciated and little studied of the everyday items that we often take so much for granted. For the writer Michael Harding, they have a way of appearing from nowhere when you least expect it. He says in one place, he says, they fall out of books or appear on the mantelpiece or turn up unexpectedly in a drawer of socks or they lie hidden for years at the bottom of some cornflakes box where Christmas lights are stored. There are times I imagine them falling out of the air like messages from the invisible world. I imagine concerned angels passing through the curtain between heaven and earth to drop the cards around the house where I am sleeping. Now many people will be familiar with the sight of prayer books bursting at the binding from years of being stuffed with memorial cards of family, relatives, and friends. Keepsakes and reminders to pray for the dead or to not let the memory of a loved one fade. Despite what was once their near ubiquity among the funeral customs of Ireland, very little has in fact been written about these items and many are unaware of their fascinating history. The Victorian period in Britain saw a huge rise in the use of, use of funeral stationery. Although the practice of sending a card with a formal invitation to a funeral was waning, from the mid-century onwards one finds the rise of small memorial cards, customarily 75 millimeters by 115 millimeters, 
which were sometimes made available at the funeral itself, but perhaps more often sent out after the funeral had taken place, especially to those for, who for some reason couldn't attend, but also to all who wished to retain a memento or a keepsake of the deceased. In addition, they served as a useful means of informing relatives abroad of a recent death. Many of these cards were intricately uh, blind embossed with pierced lace designs, and some had apertures for the inclusion of a photo of the deceased. They were produced by firms such as Wood, Mansell, or Windsor, before being passed on to a local printer who would overprint the specific details of the deceased and their date of death. They might also be part printed to allow for the addition of handwritten details. These part printed cards were often provided free of charge by undertakers who often included the title of their business and its full address on the cards, which also doubled up as a means of advertising. Cards were usually white, or more popularly, a biscuit color with a black or blind embossed border, and they frequently included low-relief images of classical features such as weeping figures, urns, broken columns, willows, and mourning angels. Cards might also be mounted on larger frame cards, which could be of varying sizes and formats. Memorial cards were produced in vast numbers, and every high street printer had a stock of simple, black-bordered cards for the cheaper kind of work with matching envelopes. Even the poorest of families would make an effort to have them printed, often going into debt to be able to do so. They were treasured items. And I came across in looking these things up, and, and particularly looking at references to memorial cards in newspapers, I came across a very poignant account, which appears in the York Herald on the 18th of November, 1884, which relates how a widow called Jane Jemima Bogey, who brought a complaint against a bailiff named John Winter, and she brought the complaint against him for assault. The widow had occupied a two-room dwelling, which was entered by the bailiff for non-payment of rent. As the bailiff, John Winter, proceeded to seize all goods and effects in the house, the complainant begged him to be allowed to keep, at least to keep, her husband's memorial card and his pillow. When John Winter, the bailiff, refused, she made an attempt to grab the memorial card from him, at which point he struck her in the eye and knocked her against a wall. And it comes up, obviously, in, it comes up uh, uh, you know, in court, and she brings a, a, an action against him. This sort of reference is actually very common. You, you get memorial cards coming up in court for all sorts of reasons. One of the reasons, actually, memorial cards come up in court, which is, is not what might come to mind first for memorial cards, is in bigamy cases. There are lots of bigamy cases in the newspapers that involve memorial cards, because you have people who, it, it, it could be a male or it could be a female, who want to marry someone else, and they say, well, their wife is dead or their husband is dead, and they produce a memorial card which they have made up for the wife or for the husband. There was one in particular uh, from 1901 that caught my eye. Uh, and Arthur Goodson, a Lambeth Water Company employee who produced a card, a memorial card for his supposedly dead wife. He even went so far as to include a nice touching verse. A light from our household is gone. A voice we love is stilled. A place is vacant in our house, which never can be filled. Until, of course, the wife was produced alive and well in court. <laughs> and her death was greatly exaggerated and fabricated. So they, memorial cards come up in all sorts of places. 
By 1900, the folding card with message and name printed inside became fashionable. Designs were lithographed and silver and other muted colors were in demand. By this stage, chroma lithographed cards had become more popular and many of the most high quality blank cards were produced in Germany and were sent to Britain for overprinting. Some of the cards produced for the victims of the Titanic disaster in 1912 were of this type. And you just get a, a sense of these cards. And, and, and you get this very, very um, commonly to record the, the, the fatalities, for instance, in, in, in disasters of all kinds. Incidentally, memorial cards were also printed and sold in the streets on the occasion of general mourning, such as the loss of, for instance, the ship HMS Captain in 1870, and also the Princess Alice disaster in 1878. And again, you get an example of these sorts of things. Princess Alice herself, the ch third child of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, died on the 14th of December of the same year in the new palace in Darmstadt in Germany. Memorial cards commemorating the princess were soon produced. One letter which appeared in Reynolds newspaper on the 5th of January 1879 grumpily reacted to the distribution by, and I quote, by some loyal and probably wide awake clergyman. I wonder is that uh, our, the equivalent of our woke uh, <laughs> clergyman of this pasteboard memento and that these were distributed to Welsh laborers over Christmas, any of whom, the, the complainant continued, any of whom would have been happier with half a pound of beef than a hundredweight of worthless cards to the memory of one he never saw, perchance never heard of. Memorial cards were sometimes produced not just to commemorate the death of humans, but also of favorite pets. One example from 1898 commemorates our gym, and along with an image of a cat, its date of death, and the motto, Semper Fidelis. And you have the words, gone, but not forgotten. The memorial card tradition as it emerged in Victorian Britain had certain similarities with, but also key differences from parallel developments in Ireland. To begin with, for the most part, the market for memorial cards in Ireland was a Roman Catholic one, and that meant that their very purpose was different. While both Anglican and Roman Catholic cards encouraged loved ones to remember their dead and functioned as keepsakes, Roman Catholic memorial cards specifically invited their owners to pray for the dead, the understanding being that most departed souls had to undergo a period of post-mortem purification that we know was known as purgatory, and in so doing depended on their living relatives and friends to secure them an early release. In addition, right up to the period of the Second Vatican Council and even beyond, Roman Catholic memorial cards often listed indulgences that could be gained either for the deceased or for the living, and we're very well familiar with those, or by the recitation of certain prayers that appeared on the card. You can see there, if I can use this here, uh, so something like that, Heart of Jesus, Once in Agony, Pity the Dying, a hundred days each time. I mean, we're very familiar with that sort of thing. The, the, the indulgences here you have, merciful Jesus, grant eternal rest of the souls of the faithful department, departed, uh, seven years indulgence. Again, another, uh, another uh, prayer here, seven quarantines, period of 40 days. And there you have uh, other examples. These two were understood to lessen one sense sentence in purgatory. Likewise, images of Catholic saints, believed to be intercessors for those who prayed to them, were a prominent feature of memorial cards from this tradition. By contrast, working out of a different theology in these matters, features such as praying for the dead, an offer, the offer of indulgences, or the invocation of saints were absent from their Anglican equivalents. But wait, did anyone 
spotted, yes? Sometimes there were even printing errors, and it's to be assumed that the Virgin Mary was not doing a handstand. It could be claimed that Roman Catholic memorial cards belong to a wider category of religious artifact that scholars today simply term holy cards. The term is applied to different types of religious and artistic objects within Catholic devotional culture over a period of several hundred years. In the 19th century, holy cards served as so souvenirs of important occasions in people's lives. Remembrance of First Holy Communion, for instance, or confirmation, religious profession, the reception of holy orders. They were handed out at funerals, they were exchanged as birthday gifts, they came with Christmas greetings, or to mark other important feast days of the church. They served as well wishes between friends, they marked the occasion of pilgrimage to a shrine, or they were given as parting gifts when members of the family were moving away from home. Indeed, 19th century French chocolatiers routinely slipped holy cards depicting scenes from the life of, lives of the saints into each box of chocolates as an incentive to buy their product. Now, why anyone needs an incentive to buy chocolate, I do not know. But obviously, they were slipped in like you might have football cards slipped in to this day. Cards known as bid, uh, bid prentices, memorializing the dead, were distributed at funerals, often at the graveside, uh, in the southern Netherlands, for instance, from the 18th century. And these normally displayed a holy picture on the front and details of the deceased on the back. However, memorial cards would not become truly popular until the 19th century, when France from the 1850s and Germany from the 1870s became major suppliers of memorial cards. In France, they were known as image mortuaire, from which we get the term mortuary card, which was often used as a synonym for memorial card. The first advertisements for memorial cards in Ireland appear in the 1870s, and firms which advertised them were keen to show that they offered the very best French designs. So, for instance, in, from 1873, there's an advertisement for Monsieur Lugo Guerreau, uh, his uh, Maison Francaise at 7 Wellington Quay in Dublin, which announced that it sold mortuary cards in sheets or printed by hundred or half hundred. Religious goods repositories in France or Germany usually supplied lithographed memorial cards to Irish printers with the reverse left blank so that the details of the individual death could be then inserted locally by letterpress printing. One can quite easily trace the evolution of the availability of memorial cards through the national and the provincial newspapers. In December 1877, for instance, the Freeman's Journal carried adverts from M and S Eaton stationers in Dame Street in Dublin, which ran in memoriam cards, an immense variety to select from 200 French and English designs large cards mounted and framed in the best style at moderate prices. While in the same issue, G.P. Warren of Cable Street advertised mortuary prints and cards, all the newest French designs received, while by 1881, Eaton's was advertising photo mortuary cards a speciality. And by 1887, they were offering Irish, English, and French patterns. An advertisement from Lyons Brothers in Grafton Street in 1890 is particularly interesting, as it announced magnificent new assortment of Irish, English, and French designs just received, patterns sent post-free on application, and wait for it, kindly state religion of deceased. Now, here we have an indication that at least as far as Lyons Brothers were concerned, they were catering for a market much wider than the Roman Catholic community alone. 
it's worth noting that although many in an Irish context will immediately associate memorial cards with Roman Catholics, this was not exclusively the case. In fact, while relatively rare, memorial cards were also printed for members of the Church of Ireland. There's an example. And again, this turned up when we were collecting memorial cards in my own parish. These memorial cards are more likely to include a biblical verse than a quotation from a saint. In one example from 1940 in this collection, we find the verse, to be with Christ, which is far better, which is a rendering of Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, or you have in a 1923 memorial card, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. There you have it at the end of that memorial card. Rather than include prayers for the deceased, these memorial cards will often cite extracts from hymnody. The 1940 example features an extract from the first verse of William Cowper's hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood. Or the verse might reference the suddenness of the persons leaving the world, as in this 1923 example. A sudden change in a moment fell, she had no time to bid farewell. It was not unusual for those who were terminally ill to choose for themselves which biblical verse or hymn stanzas they wished to appear on their memorial card. And so to return to that very revealing request in the Lyons Brothers advert, kindly state the religion of the deceased, which opens up many questions for those who automatically consider memorial cards an, exclusive, uh, an exclusively Roman Catholic tradition. Church of Ireland memorial cards clearly did exist, even if they were rare. In November 1908, the Irish Independent carried the advert for mourning cards in choice continental designs, try news printing works in Waterford. While in November 1912, the Kilkenny people were advertising in memoriam cards in all styles and mourning notepaper and envelopes. And in 1914, the Skibbereen Eagle announced the availability of memorial cards in a number of chaste designs. Prices from five and six for 12 and seven and six for 24 up. Also with portraits of the deceased at slightly increased cost. By 1916, the Nina Gargin was carrying an advert for William Gill printer, 38 Castle Street Nina, which claimed memorial cards framed and unframed a speciality. These cards were also important identity markers and acquired a particular edge when commemorating political figures. On the 2nd of November 1918, the Nina Gargin reported on a robbery of Miss Mary Kyo's shop in Main Street, Killaloo, during which photos and memorial cards of the illustrious dead of Easter week were taken away. By 1927, an advert for all classes of printing, which appeared in the same newspaper, now included the availability of memorial cards. In 1931, Patrick Gleason of Summer Hill advertised memorial cards in the Nina Gargin, and interestingly, this advert specifically mentions the place where memorial cards most often ended up. And it says, all the latest designs suitable for churches, homes, and prayer books. Memorial cards were usually stuffed between the pages of prayer books or, in, or occasionally Bibles. They often constituted the spiritual equivalent of family albums, each photo a prompt to remember in prayer a sometimes long passed on member of one's family. Mothers, fathers, grandparents, cousins, and then also members of the family we create for ourselves, our closest friends. This was, in effect, 2 Maccabees 12, chapter 12, verse 46, in action. It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead. 
A frequent quotation to be found on Catholic memorial cards is the following. We have loved her in life. Let us not forget her in death. Memorial cards also can be useful indicators of the spread of a devotion, especially key moments in which a particular devotion explodes onto the scene, even for a short period. Now, this could happen quite quickly following a canonization. A memorial card, for instance, that I have at home depicts the newly canonized Pope St. Pius X. He was officially made a saint in the year 1954. Now, what's very telling is that the card in question was chosen for a lady who died in Ross Gray just shy of 13 months later. The image of the Pope Saint was evidently chosen by her family above many other options available at the time. By any standards, devotionally speaking, Pope St. Pius X was clearly a fast mover, that he managed to make it from Rome to Ras Gray in such a short space of time. Now, many memorial cards, as I said, carried an indulgence with them. The indulgence was often associated with the recitation of a particular prayer or the expression of devotion to an indulgenced image. So, for instance, one of the early images on memorial cards was that of the crucifixion, accompanied by the prayer, My Jesus, My Jesus, uh, Mercy. This prayer carried a plenary indulgence, that is, remission of all punishment due to sin, which it was believed one had to undergo in purgatory. And it achieved remission of this when recited in front of a crucifix. As a person's stay in purgatory was understood in temporal terms, certain prayers carried partial indulgences, namely the reduction of a person's sentence by specific amounts of time. And these were often detailed on the cards themselves. So, for instance, 300 days, seven quarantines, and so on. Sometimes the person's name was inserted into the middle of the prayer itself, as in this example from 1943 for uh, James uh, Doherty. So you can see they've inserted James. It could be any other name, but they've insert, uh, asserted that's James Doherty, so you have the prayer, and you have this specifically inserted to show that it's, it, it, this is the person who is being prayed for by name. A memorial card from 1931 offered a hundred days indulgence for reciting the prayer, Heart of Jesus, Once in Agony, Pity the Dying, and 300 days indulgence for the prayer, Sweetheart of Jesus, Be Thou My Love, and likewise for, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Meanwhile, the short aspiration, my Lord and my God, meanwhile, offered seven years indulgence, as did the simple prayerful recitation of the names of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, Joseph. The more frequently the prayer was recited, the greater the reduction in your loved one's term as a poor soul in purgatory. Repetition was incentivized by adding the words each time after the stated numerical values. <clears throat> but change was on its way. One of the reforms introduced by Pope Paul VI in early 1967, shortly after the Second Vatican Council, ordered all references to specific numbers of years or days formally attached to indulgences to be dis continued. However, established practices are not always easy to uproot, and in some instances specific numbers relating to indulgences continued to appear on memorial cards right into the 1970s and indeed 1980s. What's interesting, however, is that even in the absence of explicit mention of indulgences, Many of the traditional heavily indulgence prayers continued to be reproduced in their stripped-down state on memorial cards. So here, I suppose what I'm, what I'm referring to is, here you have this short aspiration, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. You would have found this on 
earlier memorial cards, but you would have found an indulgence attached to it. But here you still have the aspiration, you have the, the short prayer, but without the indulgence attached. But these short prayers continue to appear, and the, the favorite short prayers uh, continue to appear on memorial cards. The inclusion of set prayers on Roman Catholic memorial cards was one way of ensuring that the deceased was properly prayed for and using approved and doctrinally sound texts which had a venerable tradition. Printers offered a range of possibilities and as some prayers or verses became commonly used, others tended to select them as well and so they became very well established. So, for instance, the Memorare prayer is a good example of a text that's found very often on these cards. So, you will be very familiar with it down, down here. Remember, Most Gracious Virgin Mary, and so on. Despite its title, though, the prayer's origin actually has nothing to do with remembering the dead. In fact, the prayer is attributed to St. Bernard of Clairvaux, and it addresses the Virgin Mary, asking her to remember that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, and so on. Furthermore, prayers such as the following, found on a very early 20th century memorial card, um, which uh, had a, a long lifespan, were lessons in Catholic theology in miniature. So here's an example of a prayer. O gentlest heart of Jesus, ever present in the blessed sacrament, ever consumed with burning love for the poor captive souls in purgatory, have mercy on the soul of thy servant. Then you put in the name. Bring him from the shadow of exile to the bright home of heaven, where we trust thou and thy blessed mother have woven for him a crown of unfading bliss. Some memorial cards, such as one from 1955, explicitly stated that the deceased had died fortified with the rites of Holy Church. Favorite devotions might also be mentioned, such as in the same example where another prayer runs, Our Lady of Lourdes, pray for him. In many cases, the deceased is given leave to address the to address the loved one left behind directly, and indeed to make requests. Requests such as, again, it's very common uh, to appear on memorial cards, such as, at least one Holy Communion from you, dear friend. Again, in another example from 1955. This form of direct address to the one holding the card would prove resilient and can be found um, again, right into the 21st century. So, you have memorial cards even to this day which say, all I ask of you is that whenever, wherever you may be, you will remember me at Mass and at Holy Communion. So, this is the dead person addressing their family, for instance, and their loved ones who are left behind. Along with asking for prayers, the deceased might also issue a timely warning to their loved ones left behind, to continue to live a virtuous life so that they can eventually be united in heaven. This moralizing message was usually communicated via the words of Saint Bonaventure. O oh, you whom I have loved so much on earth, pray for me and live in such a manner that we may be reunited forever in a blessed eternity. In other examples, the communication works the other way round. It is those left behind who address the deceased. The following text, for instance, is found in a memorial card from 2019, so just, just four years ago. And it, it runs, Just a prayer from the family who loved you, just a memory fond and true. In our hearts you will live forever because we thought the world of you. But such a direct form of address was nothing new. Poignantly, one example dating from 1914 asks the deceased, as we strew your grave with flowers to beg of God to cheer and bless this lonely home of ours. 
In the heartbreaking cases of the death of children before the age of reason, memorial cards did not ask the bearers to pray for the deceased soul. Rather, they often, with inevitable futility, tried to make sense of the tragic situation with lines such as the following, Jesus called a little child, or I gathered it in all its freshness before a single breeze had damaged its purity. The understanding that there was to be continued communication between the living and the dead was often written into the very cards themselves. A common verse found on, the card, found on cards is the following. Fold him, O Jesus, in thine arms. Let him henceforth be a messenger of love between our human hearts and thee. Memorial cards from the 1970s onwards are more likely to include texts that comment on the general qualities of the individual commemorated such as in the following example, he was loving and kind in all his ways, upright and just to the end of his days. But texts such as these did not automatically supplant more traditional petitions, such as Jesus, mercy, Mary, help, which one might also find on the same card. Such cards then might be regarded as hybrids in a transitional phase, reflecting both an older, more traditional approach to death and a more recent tendency to acknowledge and praise the individual's life on earth rather than solely pray for mercy for the deceased's soul. More recently still, the imagery on some memorial cards has tended to move away from explicitly religious iconography of the 19th or 20th centuries. The deceased is now more likely to be depicted surrounded by more natural settings, often a scenic backdrop, a woodland setting, or perhaps captured carefree on a beach. Alternatively, there's a greater demand for images of the departed loved one happily engaged in doing what they love to do best, whether that be knitting on their favorite armchair, playing a round of golf, supporting their local GAA club, or carrying out an aspect of the livelihood at which they spent so many of their days. The focus has slowly shifted from an emphasis on their entry into the next life and the necessity of securing them safe passage to a this-worldly celebration of the life that they have lived and the people they have blessed with their presence along the way. Now, as many of you will appreciate, memorial cards can also be very useful when doing family history and they can serve as important correctives even to the information contained on headstones in graveyards. And this was brought back to me, uh, brought across to me in a very personal way in, in, in recent times. So my, my, my father was born in 1920, and his own father, Patrick Ryan, died in 1938. And he was buried in the old graveyard in Lisboni, near Nina. And I always remember my father recalling how on that day when they were going to the graveyard, he remembers, he was only 18, and that day that they were going to, to Lisboni, it was unusually dry that day. He remembered heading to the graveyard and the pony and trap, and the dust was rising up off the roads. That's what, the way he described it. He said, the dust was rising up off the roads. It was so dry. And that was April 1938. So it was, an, you know, it was an April, very dry day in April 1938. And I brought my own children to visit um, the grave in Lisbonne of, of my own grandfather for the first time a few years ago. And they had a look at the headstone. But Daddy, I thought you said he died in April. This says the 12th of August. Thing. So there's Patrick Ryan, he's from Clan List, died the 12th of August 1938. And there's the gravestone there. They said, Daddy, I thought you said he died in April. This says 12th of August. Now this stopped me in my tracks, and I said I'd check it out for sure. 
but that I was almost 100% certain that my, my father had always said it was April. The dust was rising up off the roads. This seemed to be something unusual. If, if it was August, it wouldn't be as notable a thing. And so when I got home, I managed to dig out my grandfather's memorial card, and there it was, uh, the 12th of April, 1938, just as my father had told me. And so then it just hit me, the gravestone, but the wrong date on it. But it, the memorial card served as a corrective to a gravestone, which again, it just underlines just how useful these things can be, even for, for family history. Now, a couple of years ago, um, there was a discussion of memorial cards, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, or, or you know of Michael Fortune, the folklorist from Wexford. And Michael has a wonderful, wonderful site. Uh, if, you're, if any of you are on Facebook or whatever, there's a site, folklore.ie, and he, he posts you know, nearly every day. He has all sorts of interesting things that he posts on Facebook. But a few years ago, he, he, he posted something about memorial cards, just reference memorial cards. And of course, a lot of people follow this site. And so people commented, started to comment on how they use memorial cards and what they do with their memorial cards. I think the conversation started around, well, what do you call memorial cards in your particular part of the country? And maybe how you use them. So this discussion emerged on Facebook and Michael Fortune's folklore.ie page. <coughs> And many of the comments captured the affection in which these pieces of holy ephemera are still held, continually laden with meaning and memory. And what I want to do as I draw this, this talk to a close is to offer you a selection of those comments which appeared on Facebook in reaction to Michael Fortune's post about memorial cards, and people from all over the country were saying, oh, this is what we call them in our area, and this is what we do with them. And I'll just, uh, I'll just read them out as they were written. Um, and and, and these, these vividly illustrate the significance that memorial cards continue to have for people in what we have increasingly come to term the, the, the realm, scholars term it, the, the realm of lived religion, everyday lived religion. So here's what, what some people said in commenting on that Facebook post of Michael Fortunes. One person said, memorial cards, we call them here in Galway. My mother and granny always kept them, and I asked them both to leave me theirs. I cherish them. Mortuary cards in North Cork. My mum keeps them up by a picture of the Sacred Heart. Memory cards here in Newfoundland as well. My mother has quite a collection. It's gone by the wayside now for the most part. Then someone else says, memoriam or memory or memorial cards in Mayo. Love them, very useful for anyone into genealogy like me. Then someone else says, we call them memory cards here in Wexford. We keep our collection in photo albums passed down from my mother-in-law. Someone else says, mortuary or memory cards here in Waterford. Still have tons of them in boxes and enjoy, not the best word, looking through them and remembering people. Ah, yeah, same in my house in Wexford. Always kept them in a drawer and still do. Could never throw them out. Would, would, would be a sin almost. Memorial cards in Kildare. Older people I know have them in their prayer book and pray for each person every night. My, gran, my grandmother's collection were passed down when she died. She used to pray for each soul separately. But later in life, a nun friend told her that saying one Hail Mary would cover everyone. My mother takes them out every now and again. I only have a few so far, and I keep them together in a drawer. Memorial cards here in Waterford. My, my, my mum has put them all up into an album so that they're all together and easy to read. Another one says, mine are in a singer sewn tin box. Been keeping them for years. Someone else said, I have so many, my favorite people. I have extras and I use them as bookmarks. After reading, I say good night to them and I give them a kiss. Someone else says, I have every one I was ever given. I bring them all with me for my hospital scans and checkups for the last 20 years. 
and I pray to them all to watch over me. I also think they're a nice way to remember someone and to remember to offer a prayer for them every now and again. Someone else says, we had them all on a notice board fondly called the wall of death in our house in England. Most of my English friends felt it very weird as death is a very taboo thing here. I have my close family ones in a frame over my bed too. Nana in Wexford has all of hers in an old photograph al album, which we again fondly call the Book of Death. I love them. They're brilliant for anyone researching family history and a tangible remembrance of a loved one. Someone else says, I have my mother and grandmother's collection. They've been invaluable in doing my family tree. I treasure them. Someone else says, um, Mum just kept hers in her missile, along with a gazillion holy pictures. I, I, I was very proud of it. No one else had such a stuffed missile as Mum. Memorial cards here in Fermanagh. I have family ones sitting on my shelf in my home in France. Then someone else says, Granny kept hers in her prayer book, and if she let it fall in mass, there'd be memory cards go flying in all directions. And I'd have to get down and crawl in under the seats, getting them back for her. Mass would be over before I'd have them all gathered up. For me trouble, I'd get a Peggy's leg in the shop afterwards. I'd be, I'd be waiting every Sunday to see if she'd drop them. When she'd go to communion, I might have kind of edge it out a tad on the little ledge, bit of the seat where you put your prayer book and your beads and your gloves. And then one in particular made me smile. And it went as follows. I said, oh, the dresser at home is full of them. Every time I go home, I say hello to everyone in the dead press. My own name for it. How are ye all there in the dead press? Now, it might sound a bit insensitive, but it's my way of keeping that connection with all the people and the family that I know who have passed. It makes my mother laugh a little. Shall we have to remember the good times with the good people? What a lovely testament to the reality that the dead are, in a sense, always with us. Their lives and our lives interwoven through memory. There is a long tradition within Christianity of keeping lists of obits and of remembering the names of those who have gone before us. But it also transcends particular faiths. And I, I remember just something I came across in the last couple of years as well. Some of you may, may have come across the, the American actor and singer uh, Mandy Patinkin, who's, who, who grew up Jewish. But he often shares in interviews what has become a daily meditative practice for him. And I'll, I'll conclude with the, 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 line, the lines he, he, he often quotes. He says, it, 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 it's something that he does every day, and he says, I recite, he says, every day, he said, I recite the name, every name of every person that I've known who has passed on. And I do that, he said, because there was a line in the libretto of Carousel, and the line is, as long as there's one person on earth who remembers you, it isn't over. Thank you.